Great. Thank you so much for having us today. My name is Andy Marshall with Harness, and uh, we are excited to talk to you about testing in production with feature flags and continuous deployment and uh, all the benefits that come along with this, uh, this, uh, this process. So before we jump into the topic, we want to level set and make sure that we're on the same page when it comes to what exactly feature flags are. Uh, feature flags is a technique that was popularized by companies like Facebook and LinkedIn who wanted to release new features to a small group of users for instant feedback and to kind of use that as a way to influence their, their decisions for rolling out features across their wider base. So today, feature flags have become an essential part of any developer's toolkit and lots of companies are adopting them into their, into their process for delivering features. They've been in production use for about 10 years and uh, but it's really becoming more mainstream in the last five or six years. So as a result, we're still coming across people today that uh, are new to feature flags and how to leverage them. So as we begin our time, we're just going to take a few minutes to kind of take a look at why, why feature flags, what are the benefits of them, why, sh why you should be considering them, some of the use cases, and then how that radically changes the delivery of features. So in order to get going, let's just kind of talk a little bit uh, briefly about kind of the traditional ways we used to deploy features before feature flags. Traditionally, developers coded a feature, committed that code, they tested it, they signed off on it, QA did their pass and ran through uh, the, the new features and put it through its paces. And then there was a wait for all the features to be written and tested and kind of held in a hopper. And when all things were new and ready, uh, uh, we, we cross our, our fingers, we flip the switch and uh, we'd execute the deployment and all the features were pushed to production. So this probably sounds familiar to you. This is the way we've been doing it for a long time. And sometimes that would take quite a bit of time waiting for everyone to get their features written, have their code ready, reviewed and uh, ready to rock. So sometimes that would take months weeks at, 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 at least at a minimum, and uh, it was quite the process. And if you think that for a minute that this is kind of old and maybe antiquated and it's no longer reality, I can tell you that uh, we constantly talk to you, even Fortune 500 clients who are, are reporting that they still only release, you know, maybe four times a year and they're working as fast as they can. So this is a conversation that we have daily with co companies that are, are uh, trying to speed up their release process because they're, they're kind of doing it in the traditional way. There are some consequences that come along with this though. After you deploy your outcome, sometimes features worked, sometimes they didn't, <laughs> sometimes people got what they needed, sometimes people did not get what they needed, and some features may not have worked at all. So traditionally releasing features is kind of the consequence of an all or nothing type release. And uh, there's some, some consequences that we've noted to this. First, uh, feature releases, uh, the date is often determined by developers instead of a business. And uh, the reason being that if, if developers wrote a feature and put it into production, uh, they just released it as soon as they were done. And this often causes friction between engineering and operational teams who might want a specific release date to coincide with a business objective. There's another consequence to doing it this way, and that is uh, slower development of new features often happens because if we're only releasing every couple months, then you know it's a little bit slower to get features out. Another consequence is we can't test multiple solutions or multiple implementations because when we release all the features together and deliver that, it's kind of an all or nothing approach. So there isn't any time or, or ability to, to test those individual solutions. There's also no way to, or kind of it's cumbersome to release uh, individual features to production. So I've got to wait and, uh, and, and wait for that one big deployment. So if I have a feature ready, I can't just release one at a time. And finally, big, huge consequence here is if something goes wrong, I have to roll back the entire deploy, which means I'm rolling back all the good features due to the poor implementation of maybe just one feature, meaning I have to roll back all the good with the bad. So that's kind of traditionally how we've looked at deploying software. And uh, along came feature flags, and there's kind of a better way to do it. The mighty feature flag, it's a little tiny snippet of code that you can wrap around features 
uh, within your code base and then conditionally turn certain sections of your code on or off. And you can think of feature flags really as an extension of your CD process. It's a way to put changes into production behind a flag and then turn them on in a controlled way later. Uh, you can use them to clearly define features and components that can be changed and then toggle off and on individually. And so what this effectively does is it separates the deployment from the release and they are deployed in an off state. So you can push it all to production and then at a later time, you can turn them on. So if you are uh, uh, deploying code, the, the result is you can release when you want and you can release to whomever you want. And if a particular flag doesn't have a desired result, you can change the status of that flag and the target. And in the end, uh, we're seeing that we've got happier users who are getting the correct features at the correct time. That is a quick 100,000 foot view of the power of feature flagging. So with that, Let's just discuss uh, real quick some of the, the use cases that we see and kind of how they work. Use cases for feature flagging. The first one in the upper, upper left-hand corner here really is about increasing velocity. So as developers create a new feature, they can park it behind a flag and then they can ship it immediately into production and they get right back to working on new code. And this creates a lot of speed because you are constantly shipping, you're constantly pushing to production. And if a particular feature is broken or incomplete, it's not a big deal because it's deployed behind a flag in an off state. So the results are it's pretty, pretty safe and it isn't impacting any of your end users. It's simpler, it's faster and allows your engineers to speed up significantly and push all new features to production. And when the time is right, you can turn it on after it's been fully tested and it can go live. The second major bucket of use cases we think about when it comes to feature flags has to do more with controlling the release. So because feature flags allow you to target just a subset of users, maybe to try out a new feature before it's ready for prime time and rolled out to the entire user base, it gives you the opportunity then to get some real world feedback. And then you can make any changes and experiment before your entire user base receives that particular feature. So conducting uh, A-B testing, uh, experimentation to see how features are being received before it's ready for, for your entire user base, that is totally a use case that we are seeing currently. In the lower left-hand corner there, this box is all about uh, operational control. And so these are use cases that are really for the development teams and allow them to quickly have access to things like a kill switch or safety valves. So if something goes wrong with a new feature, you can quickly turn that feature off and within half a second or less, every connected device, every browser, every mobile user receives the same command and the offending feature is turned off. And so this goes a long way to mitigating uh, any sort of blast radius when something fails. And it's always easier to fix something um, or, or correct bad code when there aren't dozens of support tickets being created and coming in. You can just simply kill the bad offending code and immediately correct the issue. Uh, the last kind of area that we think about is that of customer accesses, access. And this is kind of a series of use cases that are, are fairly cutting edge. And it involves inviting other internal teams in your organization, like sales or product or support or marketing, to be able to have uh, uh, access to turn features off and on for particular clients. And so previously, turning a feature off and on was kind of an engineering function and something just re reserved for devs. But Harness is uh, now and Feature Flags is giving teams a little bit of a, that are closer to the client, the ability to manipulate flags, turn them off, turn them off and, and on without tying up engineering resources. And that goes a long way for progressive delivery. So Andy, pretty we powerful. Have we have a question here um, from Christopher Strickland. He, he asks, do you find any organizations are using feature flags with microservice architectures or are those architectures often 
small enough with that feature flags aren't worth implementing? And if so, could you describe the microservices with feature flags use case? And I think this slide actually maybe <clears throat> is a great one to illustrate that. Uh, what we're talking about with microservice architectures where our um, the size of our code changes are small enough that they are independent of everything else. Um, our services are very independent. And so that kind of de-risks that and actually might potentially solve that top left use case there of increasing velocity where a developer, as soon as their change to their service is done, they can deploy it right away without waiting for the others. However, uh, microservice architectures do not solve for the other three use cases that are shown here potentially uh, really around, hey, maybe we want to have different behavior of that one microservice for different customers or for testing out different uh, different iterations of a feature. Maybe I want to have a, a flag. Uh, so that'd be the top right one. Bottom left one is maybe I want to have a flag that is um, that is on and is uh, and but I have ability to turn it off whenever something bad happens, right? And that is outside of my control and outside of the the uh, uh, case of a new deployment. And then of course, lastly on the bottom right there, that's really around um, changing the behavior of the application based on a customer request or a type of a customer or letting a sales team enable a feature for a customer or something like that. Something that those three, I, I would say, are not addressed by microservice architecture alone. Excellent. Thanks, Christopher. Appreciate that, that question. Keep them coming and we will uh, we'll answer them on the fly. Just to kind of wrap up a little bit of the benefits here of feature flags and kind of what you can expect uh, when tied to your CD pipelines. Uh, first of all, it gives you a flexible way for the business to determine the date release of, of features. And, and this is one that, uh, again, has caused a little bit of friction in, in, in the past because uh, um, uh, you know, marketing product and often sales team have their own dates and kind of have their own campaigns and, and, uh, and thresholds for wanting to turn on particular, uh, as Connor was talking about, client-facing features. And so uh, feature flags allow other teams to come in and, and get these releases done on their own timeline. Uh, another great benefit of feature flags that we see is the ability to release new features much, much faster to uh, iterate rapidly without any negative consequences. So there's no more waiting for that monthly release cycle to push or that weekly release cycle to push a bundle of completed features all at one time with feature flags. You can release and push them uh, you know, as, as often as needed. So uh, those, those can be pushed to production anytime, whether it's fully functional or you're just wanting to do some testing on it or just beginning to work. Uh, another great benefit is testing in multiple solutions, testing solutions and across different implementations simultaneously to kind of determine the best approach for this particular feature. So test solutions, um, you can test these solutions to a problem in production with, with customers, you can have different cohorts, you can target individual groups of people and create the feedback for, for uh, uh, how customers are receiving this and interacting with your new features. And this creates really valuable intel uh, before a, fe a feature is going uh, to GA and ready for prime time. Uh, another great benefit that we touched on is you can easily release those features to production daily. You never have to roll back a good feature along with a bad one. You know, this is the uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater type thing. When something goes wrong in production, just turn it off. That's fine. And you can work on that. No deployment rollback is necessary for that particular feature. And all the good features that are still working can be out there in production. Uh, and, and this leads to some incredible positive outcomes. This is one of those, those tools that we actually see uh, a real uh, tangible outcome in the lives of engineers and developers and the people that are using the tools for feature flagging. Um, believe it or not, there was a, a, a study just recently done that reported 75% of feature flag users are reporting a reduction in stress when, you, when deploying new code. I absolutely love that. This makes me so happy because you think about the, uh, the life of a developer and an engineer. Um, I really like to call engineers uh, really inventors. You're, you're inventing something, you're writing new code, you're, you're producing a new feature that hasn't existed before in a way that maybe it's never been used on a platform where it just hasn't, hasn't been there before. So you are expected to invent in half the amount of time with half the amount of budget and get it done right the first time. That's pretty stressful. That's a stressful situation. But when you are using feature flags, 
great benefit in being able to hide them behind a flag, release them when you're ready, test them in production, see how they're going to work in the real world, and then quickly be able to mitigate any uh, damage should there, should there be an offending uh, feature that doesn't quite work. So that is your quick flyby on why feature flags. Unbelievable benefits. Let's just talk really quickly about... Uh, about testing in production. Back in the early 2000s, it was a great joke. And I remember this working in, in development shops where some devs would wear a t-shirt. I saw it occasionally and it says, I don't always test my code, but when I do, I test in production. And everybody laughed. We all thought that was funny. So edgy, so radical uh, of you to wear that shirt. And uh, why would they ever test in production? It just seems unbelievably risky. And, and why would we do that? Uh, that joke has actually become a reality. And so let's talk about that. Why can we test in production with feature flags? And what are the benefits of that? So to begin with, when you test in production, let's talk about what it is really quickly. It, what it is, is enables your QA and devs to gain real world insight, and you are able to then learn at scale. And so feature flags allow you to test in a true production environment with real world scenarios. And let's be honest, sometimes it's, it's really hard to recreate a testing environment with mock-up data at a smaller scale. That, that's a really tough order. So testing in production environments answers some questions that you can't simply answer just by writing great unit tests, right? So it gives you insights and answers to questions like, you know, what is your real load do when it, when, with the latest changes? Like, how is this, how is this actually working in production? And, and what do users do differently than expected? Is there any way that they're interacting with this new feature that we didn't see? Are you seeing the performance changed that you, that you hoped for? What, what does the, the performance look like? Are users reacting the way you intended? How does your change react under various stress situations? These are, these are questions that you, you have difficulty answering in pre-production environments. But when you can wrap a feature behind a flag, push it to production, target yourself as the engineer or the QA, you can actually start to see in a real world environment how this works and get valuable, valuable insight that you normally wouldn't have. And, uh, and so that's kind of what it is. And we want to be really, uh, really clear here that what we're not saying is that uh, it's simply being cavalier and just pushing to production uh, everything that you want to release and deploy and roll back consistently and rinsing and repeating. And this is not a best practice to just be cavalier about what you what you release. This is not uh, simply using live data to make things sure that things work. There is that's still what you know QA is for in, in testing in pre-production environments. But it's more about seeing how targeting yourself it works in a real environment but uh, it's not a substitute for testing. It's not skipping the pre-production testing. It's not a substitute. It's a helpful addition to your testing process. And when it's done correctly, there are incredible benefits. It highlights unexpected problems. You can instantly switch things off and on uh, without disrupting you know, any, any of the application. You don't have to redeploy. You can target specific end users or cohorts ports and, uh, and see how it works in a real world environment. So lots of benefits um, to testing in production. Andy, we have a, uh, we have a question here from Karen. Um, yeah. Karen uh, is asking, how are the flags implemented? Is it a config file? Is it like a hidden settings page or maybe a remote server that's delivering the flag settings? Um, I can take a first pass at it and you can add a more sure. detail to this if you'd like, Andy. Um, so in, in, there's a lot of different ways to achieve the outcomes of a feature flag. A um, lot like just in generally speaking, a feature flag is a Boolean value in your code, uh, true or false, on or off, show or hide, that you then change the behavior of your code based on. So at its simplest, it's a Boolean va variable that um, you have an if statement where you might show a page if it's true, you might hide a page if it's false, you might um, implement the new feature that you're trying to release wrapped in an if else statement. Um, and the question is, well, where is that Boolean value coming from? And, and so at its simplest, it could be an environment variable. 
it, a lot of our customers that are looking at harness are maybe starting with having toggles that are in a database, right? Like you might have a database table that has a bunch of key value uh, flags that are either turned on or off. Um, and then where we're seeing the market really moving to is actually having standalone feature flag solutions, harness being one of them, um, where it's actually a, a SaaS based solution where you can configure flags, roll out features and flag values across different environments. Um, kind of applies all the kind of governance and role based access control that you need to be able to do that and also decouples it from the actual environment you're deploying to. Um, so hopefully that um, addresses your question there, Karen. If there, you have follow up, um, feel free to ask another question. But like I said, at the, at the simplest, it's a Boolean value. But the question is, where does it come from? Uh, and that's really where uh, some of the power can come from is, is having a centralized solution for that. Great. Anything you want to add to there, Andrew? No, I think that was really, really well said. Um, I'll look for any other questions on that. But would you like to talk about how we're using feature flags today to roll out uh, new features and even uh, how it differs from Canary deployments. Sure, certainly. Um, so first off, uh, a lot of times you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So really, um, we're talking about the difference between flags and Canary deployments. I just maybe want to first define what a Canary deployment is, and, and then we'll talk about how it is different than feature flags. Um, so Canary deployments are an advanced deployment strategy for really reducing the risk of deployments, right? And this kind of think of it similarly to, uh, you might be familiar with blue-green deployments. And the idea with uh, both blue-green and Canary is that we uh, are deploying our new artifact into an environment and giving it a fraction of traffic, okay? Uh, why it's called a Canary deployment, it's uh, kind of named after this, uh, the Canary in a coal mine that is uh, giving us an early warning that maybe the coal mine that we're working in is running out of oxygen. Um, and so the really the, the, the benefit of a canary is to give you that early warning that's that thing you just deployed um, is having a problem before it affects everybody, okay? Now, an important thing to note with a canary deployment is we are deploying a new code artifact to a fraction of traffic. And what I mean by that is we're not necessarily targeting individual users or groups of users. It is just a percentage of our traffic. And so what that looks like in your environment is exactly what that graphic is looking like. We have our old version V1.1 deployed. We are deploying just a few instances of version 1.2 side by side with version 1.1. They're each receiving a percentage of the traffic. And really the goal of a canary is to identify if that new artifact that we're deploying, that new code version is working or not. And what I mean by working is, is it connecting to the database? Is there errors happening? Is there performance issues happening? I'm really kind of focusing on the functionality of the artifact being able to start up and work, okay? And you wanna know that before that new version, that new artifact you've deployed has 100% of your traffic subjected to it, right? If we're gonna have errors in this new artifact, if it's not gonna be able to connect, if it's not gonna be able to start up, we don't want that to be affecting 100% of our users at once. Uh, we just can just try it out with 5% of traffic or 10% of traffic, something like that. In the event of a failure with a Canary deployment, the next step would be to do a rollback and that rollback's easy, it's just, delete the Canary release. And because we still have our, our old version still running in production. Um, so you're right back to your previous version as soon as you remove that new version. Okay. So that sorry. is kind of, yeah, go ahead, Andy. Sorry, quick quick question that just came in. Um, is it considered feature flagging if you want to switch a feature on the fly for maybe a group of users? Um, and I'll take a quick pass at this if you want to add, add some thoughts mm -hmm. to it. Uh, I would say probably yes. Um, there are there's really kind of two types of, of feature flags that we think of as 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 far as uh, time, and there are kind of short temporary flags, and there are more long term flags that you might have that are permanent in your system. So, uh, Connor's talked about some of these short term flags for uh, rolling out, you know, uh, just for a uh, you know a new feature to roll out uh, to your user base. Uh, you might do it progressively over time. And once your feature is considered GA for your user base, you may then want to go in and delete that flag. Um, flags are not the number one cause of technical debt for sure, but they've got to be in the, the, the top five, right? So just leaving, leaving flags long-term in your, 
in your uh, your code base is generally you know frowned upon as it as it leads to that technical debt. But but uh, most of them are going to be short term. I would say probably you know in your system maybe north of 85, 90 percent will be short term. However, there are some long term flags that you may want in your system for long periods of time, and this could be uh, you know flags that uh, that target a cohort a group or a, a group of users that might be in a different uh, level of of, um, of products. So maybe you have a gold standard level or a silver level of clients and you go in and are, are able to turn flags off and on and features off and on, depending on their engagement with you as a client. So in that example, even for, for Harness, we have flags that are permanent in there by nature. Sales can go in and turn turn trials on and off for particular groups of people. Uh, maybe you've got flags that are set aside just for uh, particular geographies of uh, you know, West Coast versus East Coast. There are some great use cases for long-term flags in your system, and it definitely is considered a flag if you're going to switch it off and on on the fly. Anything you would add to that, Connor? Uh, no, and actually, uh, on the next slide, I'll be actually going into some of the you know benefits of feature flags and really how they are different than canary deployments. Um, oh. So yeah, I'll, I will add on to that as I go through this slide here. Um, and so just to kind of summarize what we're talking about with a canary deployment and also a feature flag. Um, yeah, go ahead and progress. Okay. Um, canary deployment being we've deployed our new artifact. We know that artifact is working. It's accepting traffic, has a low error rate, performance is acceptable. If there's a problem, we can roll it back, right? That's really very much from an engineering and uh, like artifact release perspective is what canary deployments are all about. Where flags is really about releasing that new feature the new functionality in code after, or more importantly, separately from a deployment, right? Um, and being able to release that feature uh, independent of a code deploy allows us to kind of separate the, is it working to, are we ready to release? Okay. Second part, second bullet there on the right is now we can turn on those features just for a specific subset of users in a controlled way. So after we've released the ability for our code to <laughs> serve a feature, now we can say, well, maybe we want our QA team to see it first in production, enabling testing in production. Maybe we want, want to say we have a, a cohort of our customers that are our beta testers. Let's turn it on just for them and enable them to test this out before we roll that out to 100% of our users. So going back to uh, the question that Karen asked of how are flags implemented, config file, you know, we talked about it. At the end of the day, it's a Boolean value. But that Boolean value doesn't have to be true or false and nothing. There's an in-between. It could be true for just a subset of our users and false for the remaining. Um, so that's really where advanced feature flag techniques um, and, and solutions really come into play. So we talked about testing and production, beta testers, um, operation toggles too. Releasing a feature and then maybe uh, if in the future we realize, hey, you know what, this, uh, this, new fe this feature that's been out there for six months, it's currently pounding our database. Uh, we got to turn it off. Yeah. Well, you don't want to have hot fix that code and redeploy code to be able to turn off the feature. Just click the toggle, switch off the switch off the feature. We have a, now a kill switch to allow us to change the behavior of our application in real time, separate from the deployment of code. And that's really uh, where the value comes in. Um, so quickly to just kind of summarize here, when we're talking about Ask, answering the question, when should I use feature flags versus when should I use canary deployments? Both techniques are really to enable progressive delivery, right? Both techniques reduce the risk of making changes in your application. You need to release code into production before you enable feature and canary satisfies that. And then a canary really isn't appropriate for testing of features or running beta programs. That's what feature flags are for. Um, so I would, uh, I would posit and recommend that in fact, you should use both. Right? Use canaries for your deployment strategy, feature flags for your feature release strategy. And it is additive and it builds on to each other to really unlock the power of progressive delivery. And ultimately our goal here is to de-risk the release of code while decoupling the release of code uh, from features. I'm seeing a bunch of questions come in, Andy. Anything yeah, you could yeah, hit right uh, now? Jorge is asking, how do you deal with obsolete feature flags? And what he means is features that should be removed because uh, they wouldn't be used anymore. So um, what do you do with the, the accumulation of, of obsolete code or obsolete flags? I think I summarized that correctly. Yep. So obsolete flag, 
would be a flag where maybe we um, we first create a feature and we roll it out to 10% of our users. Maybe we test out different iterations of that feature. We roll it out to them and find the winner, find the one that works the best. We roll out 50% of our users. And finally, we roll out to 100% of our users and it's on. Uh, that feature is enabled for everybody. So at that point, the if statement that's left in our code is always true, right? Uh, there's no reason to have that if check. There's no reason to be able to um, need to ever turn it off. Now, so this gets away from, well, what if we want to have a kill switch? You may want to leave it in if you eventually want to be able to turn it off. But assuming we've gotten to the point where this feature is done, it is released, it's out in the wild, and we're never going to turn it off. Now we have some dead code. We have, uh, in this case, an obsolete feature flag. And the best practice there is actually clean that up. Once you have flags that are 100% released, um, there should be part of your software development lifecycle that is to remove that dead code, to remove that technical debt that is that feature flag. Um, so it, it is important to uh, accept that as we adopt creating of flags as part of our software development lifecycle, removing the flags also needs to be considered at the same time. Anything to add, Andy? Yeah, that's good. That's good. I wouldn't add anything to that. Perfect. Thanks for the question. Um, I think we're gonna we're we're gonna end on on number three here, which is just touching on how feature flags give you incredible speed and really speed up your your software uh, delivery uh, lifecycle. So a few years ago. Um, actually, quite a few years ago, I went and I climbed Mount Rainier in Washington. It's a uh, one of the, the, the largest mountains in Lower 48, and I was taught uh, taught that the quickest and easiest way to climb a vertical mountain is with something that uh, mountaineers called a rest step, and it involves taking just one step and then stopping and and uh, breathing, and then you take another step and you breathe and you take another step, and it's just this continual process. And so the result is you're constantly moving towards the summit and, and you actually end up moving up the mountain at a much faster, consistent pace because you're not doing these quick sprints and these stops and quick sprints and these stops. And it reminded me of the old, uh, you know, turtle versus the, the rabbit example uh, that we learned about when we were kids. And the same is true for feature flagging. So a couple of benefits here that the feature flags give you that help you speed up. And we've, we, we, we touched on it uh, in prior slides here, but this whole idea of decoupling the deployment from the release, this really is kind of the secret sauce of feature flagging. It means that I can ship consistently dozens of times a day, even, even more than that, and then release when ready, or even, you know, better yet, turn on the release release, uh, turn that release over to a, a complete other team internally, another business unit, so that that uh, as a developer, I can continue to code and produce more features uh, rather than having to, to go through the whole entire uh, uh, delivery system of that particular uh, feature. So huge, huge benefit. And the, the end result is that I, I, I get a higher velocity on the amount of features that I'm, I'm deploying because I'm able to decouple that deployment from the, the release. And going back to the mountain analogy is that smaller steps lead to this higher velocity. So if I make a misstep in a particular deployment of one feature, I can correct the course pretty quickly. I don't have to pull back the whole entire build and uh, redeploy. So it's this whole idea of I can aim well and just shoot once. And, and again, just touch on it. I don't have to roll back all the good features, you know, along with the, the offending feature, the bad feature. And uh, so the, the idea here is uh, I, I had a client who was in North America and the, the engineering team created a new feature. They released it to their production server and they went to bed. The, uh, the team in uh, Australia woke up to a complete mess. <laughs> they, they woke up to uh, their Twitter feed blowing up and support tickets coming in and all kinds of issues because the particular feature didn't work. Uh, thank God they, they had some feature flags that were able to go in, turn it off immediately and isolate that blast radius and leave it to the North American team who originally made the, the feature to be able to, to, to fix it. And it's always easier to fix things that you've produced and to correct that issue. But the Australian team, they were able to mitigate it within moments. And so it speeds you up. You can only just roll back the bad offending feature and you can leave the good features in production. So it eliminates this all or nothing approach, meaning either everyone gets all, all the new features or they get none at all. 
and you can roll back just a small percentage uh, of the uh, roll it out to a small percentage of the users at a time. You get this granular control, real time feedback from clients about new features, and uh, it poten uh, potentially closes the, that loop there and creates more velocity. And also, um, yep, faster feedback. I hit that. And 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 on all the 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 uh, these 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 loops of being able to push to production become much shorter, increase your velocity. This is one thing that we're seeing at Harness. We used to release to production, Connor. I think probably once a month. We got it down to maybe even once a week. And I just recently heard we're we're pushing to production over a hundred times a day now. And the way we're doing that is through having a very robust, mature CI CD pipeline. However, that's not enough. We add feature flags to the tip of that pipeline and granularly control kind of a micro way, individual features to who is, is being targeted, which groups, which cohorts, and we're able to have that kind of micro, micro control. And it's critical. It's critical that we are able to learn from testing in production. It's critical that we can target granularly. And, uh, and then in turn, that creates a lot of velocity. And so routinely, we're seeing uh, big companies uh, uh, adopt this, adopt feature flags, be able to leverage it and create that uh, velocity in their code production. Uh, and so we're excited to share this with you as well. It's the number one thing that is helping clients speed up drastically. So with that, we're going to go into a, a little bit of time of, of Q&A here. We've got a little bit of time left. Um, Connor, I'll turn it over for you. There's a couple of questions we, yeah. in the hopper there. Before and, we uh, go to questions, yes, I actually sir. want to see if we, we're going to try something new. Um, uh, we're, I want to actually want to pull the attendees here. Um, All right. And really the, the, the ultimate question that this is about is how do we get started and how do we adopt feature flags? And what I want to know is for the folks that are attending, participants of this webinar, um, there should be a, a, like a raise your hand feature in the mm -hmm. Zoom view. Hopefully it does. But what I'd like to hear is how many of you have some way of changing the behavior of your application um, in, in real time. So that could be a config value in a database. That could be an environment variable. That could be, you know, changing a file or something like that. Some, some way of modifying the behavior of the app to turn things on or off uh, to, in real time. Um, and I'm just going to give it a minute for folks to start raising their hands. And really what the reason I'm asking is because um, this whole notion of a feature flag isn't like completely revolutionary. It's been around forever. It's just like part of a regular software development practice. We have Boolean values that change the behavior of our app. That is normal. But by calling them a feature flag and putting parts of our application behind a feature flag is when we start to unlock all the benefits that Andy and I have been talking about here today. Um, it's now not just a engineering effort that is, you know, within our code, it is now exposing this toggle to be able to be used separate from the deployment of code, right? So let me, uh, let me take a look at how our poll is doing. Out of the roughly 50 attendees we have, I'm seeing eight hands up. So what's the math there? Yeah, so that's about 15% of attendees are saying they already have some kind of capability around this, right? Um, and I, I guess um, the reason I was asking is because um, clearly this is a, this is a provides value. So there's a reason why you're doing this. Um, and so I'm glad to see that some folks are already starting with that. And, um, and really it's all about how can we operationalize that this idea of a feature flag and have it exposed outside of just a Boolean value in a database or something like that. Cool. Uh, Andy, any comments on that or thoughts? Uh, I actually do have a question, and this this question has popped up several times. It's it's one I get frequently. Um, since there's only about fifteen percent of people that are are actually using feature flags, it sounds like, or or implementing some kind of solution. How how do people get started? So, um, what what's your what's your advice, Connor, to a, a new team that is looking at uh, putting feature flags in place? How should they approach that? Mm -hmm. Is it across the whole entire org? Do they? Target, target a, a specific uh, avenue to start with. What, what's your suggestion there? Well, yeah, so like what I mentioned earlier, it is kind of part of the software development life cycle in that it needs to be a part of, it needs to be planned, right? Maybe you are in your sprint this week, you're working on a story, a Jira story that is uh, a new capability or a new feature that your developer, uh, your customers are depending on. Um, 
a story is a feature. Let's just say that's the case. And all the code that you write around that to be able to change the behavior of your app or introduce a new UI experience or something like that, um, wrap that in an if else statement and have that variable define if it's on or off. Um, so in that case, your application should be able to support both on and off uh, the old behavior and the new behavior. Or maybe if you're introducing a brand new module in the application that you build, hide that module behind a flag, hide the menu item to get to that module, whatever is a different uh, a way that you can have that be more dynamic. Okay, so uh, I guess to, to get started, it's just whatever you're working on today, wrap it in a wrap it in a flag and keep it dark until it's ready to go up. I think another great rule of thumb that um, I'm hearing from a lot of the folks that I'm working with is they're using flags, even if they may not necessarily think they use it in the future. That doesn't mean they're leaving it in there permanently, but uh, they're putting a flag in on new code that they're producing, new features they're producing, just in case they are needing that flag in the future. It's great uh, insurance should, you know, a, a offending feature not work properly, and then they will deprecate that flag when it's ready for GA. So uh, that's one way to think about it. You could wrap anything in a flag, which leads me to an additional question, which is, is there anything you should not wrap in a flag, Connor? <laughs> Um, I would say uh, things that might be considered more application configuration, like not necessarily changing the behavior of the app, but uh, or not necessarily changing the behavior of the app from how your end user experiences it, but just how the app should work, like connecting to a database or, uh, you know, what ser uh, server should it uh, connect to to get its backend data, things like that, things that would typically be very strictly configuration of the application, I would argue not really appropriate to be a flag, although it definitely could be used for that, uh, for that, um, uh, for that use case. Um, and then, uh, I, I don't know, I guess I'll just leave it at that. There's really nothing else I can think of that is not appropriate to be a flag. I, I think this is uh, this is one area of, uh, or a area of software development that's really fun because we're hearing about all kinds of new use cases are coming out all the time. And so my knee jerk reaction outside of what you said, Connor, is wrap everything in a flag. As long as it's not connect, uh, you know, adding to your, your technical debt that you're uh, deprecating those, those flags at, a, at, a, at, a, at another time and making sure that you're removing those. But we're seeing lots of uses, uses for, for feature flags that are pretty inventive. Um, another question here, in case of a rollback and, uh, and, and you just simply turn that feature off, then what uh, kind of is the question here? Are we gonna leave that broken code in production till the next deploy? Yeah, uh, of course not. So the, the ability to have a kill switch on a feature or the ability to use a feature flag to turn off a feature that is part of a failed release um, is about reducing the duration of time it takes to roll back, right? Instead of having to quickly code up a hot fix and redeploy it or um, you know if, if rollbacks of the actual code take a while the flag is about immediately turning it off however that is only the first step in the actual remediation of a failed release um, that should then kick off the actual development time that needs to be done to actually fix the code but the benefit there the value is now we it's our leisure like it's not hair on fire for you know nine o'clock on a friday night that we're trying to hot fix uh, we turn it off when it's not working and we'll get back to it on Monday because uh, because production is not being currently affected. Yeah. Um, another question that came in, as interesting and powerful as feature flagging sounds, what are the best practices for avoiding creating spaghetti code? So the term spaghetti code is probably referencing the fact that if as you're suggesting, Andy, if everything's a feature, um, mm -hmm. by you know, in you know, only a matter of time, we're going to have a, a class or a method that has like ten flags in it, and we have a, a lot of nesting of if else statements. Like it can get complicated, certainly, um, and that's just where, um, like, if you are adopting feature flags in such a way that it could result in that, now you just need to have a little bit more intentional of a plan. And maybe decide at what granularity flags are, right? A lot of my customers, a flag is uh, very high level. Is this module turned on or off, right? 
Um, for other my other customers, it's every single uh, P PR is a flag, right? And we have it. So in which case there could be potentially lots of them. Um, I would recommend to, however, uh, to avoid that is to have a flag for a story. And, and in which case now you're not having millions and millions, you're having only hundreds and hundreds. And what I mean by that is a story uh, describes the, the experience that the user can have. Um, and then that way it reads well in your code because the code that you write should relate to the, uh, to the story. But uh, again, uh, James, your question about how do we avoid spaghetti code, that it's, it's a problem that's gonna plague you no matter if you're using feature flags or not, right? It's just right. good development practices are, are going to uh, help you out there in general. Yeah, Connor, another thought I have on that is uh, if you're using feature flags to make sure you have a great tool that will give you some uh, dependencies too. So if you create flags, you can you can have dependencies and which flags are relying on which flags because you can actually start to get in a situation where you're nesting flags. I was talking to uh, a, a national brand, uh, Fortune Fortune 500 um, uh, company not too long ago. And uh, one of the engineers said, we have 600 flags, but we're, they're all tied together and we, we didn't track the dependencies. And so we're not really sure, you know, what uh, what what is connected to what. And if I flip a flag, I don't want to take down portions of my my application. That is a that's a great great question. And so uh, I would suggest uh, if you're if you're struggling with spaghetti hell or or having too many nesting flags, uh, get yourself a great feature flagging tool, and uh, that will help create a lot of clarity and give you a lot of confidence when you are turning flags off and on. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just want to step back to one of the questions we asked uh, that was asked earlier, like how do we get started? What's what's appropriate to be the first flag that I do? Um, and I, we, uh, I mentioned like it should be for a specific new feature or a specific story, but another common use case, and you can tell, you guys tell me if, uh, if you agree that this might happen in your organization where um, we're building this new feature, but we're not really quite sure how it should be work, right? We don't know necessarily should, you know, as simply as should the button be blue or should it be green or should um, should the, you know, suggestive cell be in line or should be a pop-up uh, in the user's experience, right? And we can go through all this effort of developing this new feature, release it out and realize, hey, you know what? I wanna make some changes to it. Maybe we wanna have it be blue instead of green. Maybe we wanna have it be a pop-up instead of, and, and really what this, um, a, a potential other use case and the first time to get started with feature flags is to test out a multivariate feature. I want to build this feature and I want to have two different iterations of it and I want to release both and I want to then test A and B, right? Have half of my users get this experience, have half of the, my users get this experience or maybe test one experience for a week and then at the end of that week switch it to the other experience. Um, that's another um, important use case. And now we're uh, just getting back to what I was saying earlier, we're getting away from engineering practices and we're getting into product management practices, right? We're enabling more um, uh, iterative and quick iterations of our product development um, and in making that independent of code deployments and re releases like that. So an important thing to consider. We have, um, we have less than 10 minutes left. And so I want to make sure that if anyone does have questions, they should get them into the Q and A quickly. Um, and uh, Andy, next yeah, question. quick question here: uh, Are there any tools which can show you a dashboard of all the feature flags and their state? Absolutely. If you head over to, to harness.io, you can uh, download our feature flagging tool there for free and you can uh, play with it. It is really powerful. There are other tools on the marketplace as well, but a great feature flagging tool is one that will give you fantastic insight. Uh, we, we leverage Looker uh, in our dashboard to be able to slice and dice the data, you know, hundreds of ways for you to be able to have the visibility you want as to which flags are deployed in which environment and um, and what their current state is. So that is paramount if you're using feature flags at you, you get a platform that, that uh, will help you administer that. Yep, great. And uh, Christopher Strickland has a question. How is the logic like for a multivariate feature flag given that the default implementation is binary? So I did state earlier that at the simplest, a feature flag is a Boolean variable, true and false. Um, however, multivariate, uh, feature flags would be typically a string or maybe a JSON object or a number, 
a, a, like an integer or something like that. So feature flags don't just need to be Boolean typed variables. They could be strings um, or complex objects like yeah. a JSON object or something like that as well. So that that is how you would achieve a multivariate um, multivariate feature flag. Maybe the actual value of the feature flag can toggle between off the string off inline and pop up or off blue green yellow right thing and actually the um actual evaluation of that string is how you change the behavior or maybe that you'd like literally set to be a css or a yeah a, a html class or something like that to be able to um, change those variations great well i i don't see any other questions just checking here connor did you have any other questions that came in on your side that is all I have. All right. Well, with that, uh, Marisa, we're going to head it back to you. Thank you so much for inviting us today to talk about feature flags. It is a topic we are pretty passionate about. Uh, lots of information over at harness.io for you. Oh, one last question that snuck in under the wire here, Connor. <laughs> Can, yeah, that was good, James. Good job. Can feature flags be self-service, um, in other words, at your own risk? Not sure if I'm understanding that. Let's I go with the first part what, of that. Can feature James flags be self-service? I yeah. believe what James is getting at is, do we need to have a third-party solution to to uh, to gain there the you benefit go. of feature flags? And I think the, or could it be self-service? Like, can you build it yourself? Like uh, clearly, as as DevOps engineers and engineers ourselves, we could probably build anything, right? Um, you can build your own. Um, you know, and the, the question is, do, you, do would you want to maintain that? Is really the question. Um, like I said, a lot of our uh, customers that adopt Harness have previously had database toggles or environment variable toggles or something similar, and they're looking for a more um, a more uh, enterprise grade solution that give, gives features like access control, automation, things like that. Uh, so, that, but certainly, a feature like this could absolutely be self service or DIY. Mm -hmm. And Christopher thanks. says, "Thanks for the presentation. I thank you all as well. <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for joining everybody." Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Connor and Andy. I, I for one, learned a lot from the presentation today. So I really appreciate you guys taking your time to be here with us. And thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Just a quick reminder that this uh, presentation will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. So we hope you'll join us for future webinars. Thanks so much.